In this lecture, we're going to be reviewing the atrial and junctional homework that you did, and we'll talk about some interventions as well. This is Ginger Keen. Let's start with the first strip, which is 7-1. In looking at this one, we're going to look at the rhythm, and it actually is considered irregular. So the R to R is irregular. The rate, we would use the six second strip. So again, you're only going to count the many the number of R waves between your six seconds. So you have six, you multiply that by 10, so you have a heart rate of 60. So your P waves, you do not see any P waves. They are fibrillatory waveforms. So basically you have along the isoelectric line is very fibrillatory. So we cannot do a PR interval. The QRS is normal. Uh, 0.06 to 0.08, so we know it came from the atrium. So that's part of your interpretation is where did the impulse originate? It originated in the atrium. So we know it's atrial. So we have fibrillatory um, waves, so we call it atrial fibril fibrillation. It is considered a controlled rate, but also note that it has some ST depression. Again, you may want to consider getting a 12 lead EKG just to confirm that there's no ischemia going on. And anytime you have a patient in atrial fib, they should be anticoagulated. In 7.2, this rhythm is regular with a heart rate of 188. You can't really see the P waves because they're hidden if there are any, but with a heart rate of 188, I can safely say that they're not in sinus, so we cannot do a PR interval. The QRS is normal. It is 0.06 to 0.08, and again, when you have a normal QRS, that means that your patient's, their impulse came from the atrium, so it was above the ventricles, and it was able to go down in through the bundles of his and therefore creating a normal QRS. So that allows synchrony of both ventricles to depolarize. So that's, we know when we look at these QRSs, normal QRSs mean that the impulse originated in the atrium. So your rhythm interpretation is supraventricular tachycardia. Now I understand Huff has said that PSVT, or proximal supraventricular tachycardia, but to, find, to define that, it means that there is a starting point and a stopping point. So in this strip, you can't see where it starts and stops. So you most likely will hear people use terminology more so of SVT, or supraventricular tachycardia. So with your SVT, your treatment is thinking about are the patients stable or unstable. If they're stable, you can assist them with a vagal maneuver, whether they can cough hard or bear down. Um, those are, if there's potentially could break that with a vagal maneuver, if it does not work, then you would use adenosine, six milligrams IV push very rapidly with a 20 milliliter um, flush. If that didn't work, you can try a 12 milligram IV push very fast. And again, if it's SVT and they're unstable, where they have signs of hypotension, shortness of breath, chest pain, diaphoretic, then you would want to synchronize cardiovert very quickly. And don't forget, when you synchronize cardiovert, you should identify these R waves. You're going to see little dots or little arrows above the R waves, identifying the R waves. So when you synchronize cardiovert them and you deliver the shock, it will not land the R on T. In 7.3, this rhythm is primarily regular, except for with these, it makes it irregular as these premature beats. The rate would be 94. And again, when you're doing the rate, you're looking at the R to R's, the difference of how many boxes before, and then using your small box conversion table. There are P waves, so they are sinus. Your PR interval. And again, when you're measuring your PR, you're measuring right in front of the P to the QRS. And with that PR interval, it is 0 0.12 to 0 0.14. Your QRS is normal, so I'm going to just confirm where you're measuring, right beginning to where the 
S wave comes up to the isoelectric line. So you would kind of count how many boxes if you do a straight line. It looks like about two boxes. So the rhythm interpretation of this is normal sinus rhythm with two PACs. So with this, you would note that these are P waves. And for a premature beat, it would be either PACs or PJCs. PACs do have, it comes from the SA node, so it's going to produce a P. The P may look a little different sometimes, but for the most part, it is a P wave. And these are premature, and therefore these are two PACs. In this rhythm, 7.8, the rhythm is considered irregular. Okay, so therefore you cannot use the small box conversion table. So your heart rate is 80. Now you can actually do a heart rate for your atrial because that's kind of regular. So if you were to take between, you can pick some fibulatory waves because that's there's no P's, it's just fib waves. I'm trying to make a, you would go from like fib to fib wave. And then you again, count the boxes. I'm just kind of showing you where you can from one point to another point and that comes to about 240 so you have atrial flutter waves that are replacing your p waves so you cannot measure a pr interval because there's no p your qrs is normal it is 0 0.8 to 0 0.10 so you know that it's coming from the atrium that is part of your rhythm interpretation so where did it originate atrium what is going on where in the atrium it's flutter waves so these are flutter waves atrial flutter and we call this with varying AV conduction meaning that there are so this one has three three flutter waves this one has three this one has two so it varies so it's from two to three some of them may have four so that's why we call it varying conduction because you'll see a varying number of flutter waves in this rhythm it is considered regular now now you can see that there are flutter waves along the baseline so you do but because the ventricular rate is regular we can do a regular rhythm with the small box conversion table so that is rate of 79 your flutter waves they are at a rate of 237 so you can count from the tip of one flutter wave to the tip of the next one and again you can kind of measure that and count how many boxes and that came comes to 237 so your P waves are basically flutter waves three flutter waves to each QRS so we can't measure a PRI because there's no P's. Your QRS is normal, so we know it comes from the atrium. So that is part of your rhythm interpretation. So atrial, and we know that those are flutter waves, so we're going to call this atrial flutter. And because you have a defined 3 to 1 conduction, you can see there's three flutter waves to each of the QRSs. And therefore, that makes the R to R regular. In 715, you have two rhythms here. So in the first part of the rhythm, they're both regular, but they are different rates. So both of them are regular. The first rate is 167, where the second rate is about 94 to 100. So in the first rhythm for P waves, you can't see any P waves. They're hidden if there is any, but probably that's going way too fast to be a sinus rhythm. So in the second, you do see P waves, so there are sinus P waves, okay, before each QRS. So the PR interval, we're only going to measure the PR intervals of the P, the ones that have P's. So when you're measuring your PR interval, you're measuring from the beginning of the PR, the P, whoops, that's very messy. Let's see if we can do it again. To where it comes to right. So you're going to measure your PR interval is about 0 0.16 to 0 0.20. And your QRS is normal for both rhythms. So we know both rhythms came from the atrium. So the first 
rhythm is basically 0 0.06 to 0 0.08. So both of them are coming from the atrium. So your rhythm interpretation is you can kind of call this PSVT, proximal S supraventricular tachycardia, you can see where it stops. So this stops right here and then the patient converts to sinus. So we can note that this is either, you can say it's SVT converting to normal sinus rhythm or you can say PSVT, but usually pre proximal SVT is usually you see a start place and a ending place. But for the most part, that terminology, you can say it's SVT to converting to normal sinus rhythm. And really, you wouldn't really have to do anything for this except monitor why the patient went into SVT because you don't have to convert the patient because they already converted on their own. So you would not um, give them any adenosine because, again, what adenosine would do is would be hopefully to convert them to sinus rhythm. You would not synchronize cardiovert them because, again, the idea is they've already gone converted by themselves into normal sinus rhythm. In 717, this rhythm is considered irregular, and the heart rate is slow. It's 40. And for P waves, you have fibrillatory waves. So you cannot measure a PR interval. The QRS is normal, so we know it came from the atrium, which is where the impulse originated. So we're going to interpret this rhythm as atrial fibrillation, okay? And just remember, don't try to make P's that aren't here, there. Many people will say, looking at the fibrillatory lines, they'll say maybe, you know, this is a P, or is that a P, or is this a P, but don't, they're not. They're just fibrillatory waves. So we are not in any sinus. This is atrial fib, and we are rate controlled. We are actually over controlled, so therefore, this is a bradycardia that probably they need to back off either a beta blocker or a calcium channel blocker, but you would definitely need to do a medication reconciliation to determine um, if this patient is, you know, on too high of a dosage. They may need brady algorithm support if they become symptomatic, so you can try atropine and you can try pacemaking. You could try on a dopamine drip or an epi drip, but this could be symptomatic, causing the patient to become symptomatic with such a low heart rate. In 739, so this patient is regular. The heart rate is 136. You do have P waves before each of the QRSs. Your PRI is 0.16. 0.20, just making sure you see where you're measuring your PR right before the P and right before the QRS. This is your PR segment. Your QRS is 0 0.06 to 0 0.08, so that is normal. So we know it came from the atrium. It actually came from the SA node or the sinus node. So because the heart rate is greater than 100, we're going to put tachycardia right down on the bottom. Right, we'll say tachycardia. I'm sorry, I'm using a mouse to spell, so it doesn't always look so pretty. Not that my handwriting is much better. So anyway, we have sinus tachycardia, and we have one PAC. So how do we know it's a PAC? So let's erase this mess. How do we know it's a PAC? Because we're going to look at, right before, is this a P wave in here? Now, if you are looking at all the rest of the T waves, they are kind of rounded. This one is peaked, so that usually indicates that there's a P in that T. So therefore, we know this is a PAC and not a PJC. So if you have a premature beat and you want to know where it came from, whether it's a PAC or a PJC, take a look at those T waves. Compare the T waves to the one that is right before that premature beat. And note that it is pretty peaked and therefore it probably has a P in there. So your treatment for sinus tach would be find the cause of it. Find out why are they in sinus tach and treat that cause. If it's hypovolemia, if they're in pain, um, you know, look at the patient if they have a fever. So treat that sinus tachycardia. Treat the cause. 
and 7.40. So this rhythm is actually irregular in the beginning, and then it goes regular. So you have two rhythms. So your heart rate is about 120. Now, how did I get 120 when there's not a six second strip? Well, probably if you had a strip from the other side, you might be able to determine those six seconds. But let's take it into consideration that if you have three seconds strips, three second strips, and you have one, two, three, four, five, six, six complexes or six R waves. Now, instead of multiplying by 10, you're going to actually multiply by 20 because you know you have now three seconds instead of six seconds so multiply that by 20 it gives you a heart rate about 120 so that's how you can figure out your heart rate if you don't have a full six second strip you can use three seconds in an irregular rhythm all right so you do have two rhythms the first one we're looking at that baseline is there's no p's it's fibrillatory. In the second one, you do have P's. Those are sinus. So these are P's and they are sinus. So we have two rhythms. The second heart rate is 88. We already determined that it's regular, so we could say it's uh, 88. You have atrial fib in the beginning, and then you convert to sinus rhythm. You can do PR intervals for your sinus rhythm, so you would measure right before the P to the QRS. Okay, so that is about 0.12 to 0.16, and your QRS is normal throughout all of the both rhythms, so therefore you are 0 0.06 to 0 0.08. So your rhythm interpretation is you are in AFib, and then you can it's at an uncontrolled rate, so any rate above 100 is usually considered uncontrolled, and then it is converting to sinus rhythm. So we have AFib that converted to sinus rhythm on its own. And you really don't have to do anything except if the patient's anticoagulated, obviously, hopefully, but patients can go in and out of atrial fib, and it's, the issue is if it's over 48 hours that they've been in AFib that they can develop the clots in their atriums and cause a clot to wind up in their ventricle, right ventricle, and therefore they can develop a PE. So we would always kind of hope patients that are having palpitations for more than two days, they would probably need to be anticoagulated. So this rhythm, 7.48, is irregular. It's irregularly irregular. The heart rate is 150. Again, you remember you're measuring between your six seconds and how many of these you have. You have 15 R waves. Your P waves are no P waves. They are fibrillatory waves. So you cannot do a PR interval. Your QRS is normal. So that's determining that the impulse came from the atrium, 0.04 to 0.08. And your rhythm interpretation for this would be atrial fibrillation. Now, because your heart rate is greater than 100, we are saying that this is uncontrolled atrial fib. So also note that you do have some ST depressions, okay, because it's below the isoelectric line. So we have ST depressions, which would be could be significant. So you would consider getting a 12 lead EKG. This is a fast heart rate. Sometimes patients can't tolerate that fast of a heart rate and their myocardium can develop ischemia. So we would always want to get a 12 lead EKG and always assess your patient. And then you would want to consider rate control. So we will probably anticoagulate this patient, but in order to get rate control for ventricular rate, you would want to consider a beta blocker or a calcium channel blocker to decrease the impulses going down the AV node. So therefore you would have a more controlled ventricular rate. Now we're gonna do junctional rhythms. In 8.1, so this rhythm is considered regular, it, then it's considered irregular with the premature beat, PJC. So the underlying rate is 79. P waves, we have sinus P waves except for one P wave that is inverted with that PJC. Your PR interval is 0.12 to 0.14. You will note that your P wave, your PR interval is a lot shorter for your P 
JC. Okay, so with that said, your QRS is normal, so we know it came from the atrium. So we are in a um, QRS is 0 0.06 to 0 0.08. We know it came from the SA node, so we are calling this normal sinus rhythm with 1 P. J C. So when you're looking at your premature beat, it's the QRS is normal, so we are now either a PAC or a PJC. A PAC would have an upright P. This is inverted, so this P wave is inverted, so we know it came from the junction, which would be the bottom of the atrium and going in the opposite direction, so therefore it's causing an inverted P wave. So this is a sinus rhythm with one PJC. In 8.4, this rhythm is regular except for there is a pause. The rate of the regular rhythm is 58. There are P waves except for the fourth complex does not have a P wave. So you can measure your PR interval for your For your regular rhythm or your sinus rhythms, so the PR is about 0.16 to 0.18. Your QRS is normal, so your QRS you're measuring again from the beginning of that R wave to where the S comes in is about two, two and a half boxes. So from the beginning, so that's about two boxes. So this one is probably two and a half boxes. Um, so we know that it came from the atrium, so when our interpretation is, so since your heart rate between these R to R's are 58, we are in a sinus Brady. So we are in a sinus Brady, but then we have, I'm going to erase all this stuff so we can take a better look at this rhythm. So now we are in sinus Brady, but we have this beat that is longer than the other. So we call, and it's junctional because there is no P. So we call this a junctional escape beat. And what happens is, as we had discussed in the first lecture, is that you have, if your sinus SA node fails to fire, you have a backup pacemaker, which is in the junction. So you have your heart. There's your SA node. There's your AV node, and then you have your bundles. So if your SA node fire, fails to fire, deep around the AV node in the junction, it can fire and take over as a secondary pacemaker. Now, because it's slower, it's going to be kind of cause a pause. So it did not pick up a sinus beat, so it kicked in as a backup pacemaker. And then your SA node fired back, came back in here. So it's all good. So your, pace, your SA node came back in. So we call this a sinus Brady with a junctional escape beat. If you were to measure this pause, any pause you should always measure, you measure from R to R, count how many boxes are between here, and then multiply that by 0 0.04. And you, I cal calculated that the pause is 1.84. So that is the pause for this rhythm. You really would not have too much uh, intervention. You would see if the patient is symptomatic with the bradycardia. If you're seeing a lot of junctional escape beats, that may warrant you to kind of investigate the patient's condition, if they're having any pain, if their vital signs are stable, and if it continues, it may be something that you want to see what's going on with that patient and investigate. Medication reconciliation, labs, 12 lead EKG. And 8.5, this rhythm is regular, but you have two rhythms. You have the first three beats are one rhythm, and then the last rhythm is a different rhythm. So with that said, you have two rhythms, but both of them are regular within themselves. The first one has a rate of 84. The second one has a rate of 94. Now for P waves, you do have sinus P waves in your first three complexes. These are all sinus because they're upright. They all look the same. Then in the second part, they're all inverted. So they're coming from 
the junction. So we're going to draw our heart, your SA node, your junction. So it's going in the opposite direction, and it's going to be upside down. And you'll have a very short PR. So if you're looking at your sinus PR, that is about 0.12. However, your junctional is really short, so it's kind of right there, so it's going to go right down. So if you have a conduction, it yeah, it's going to go up in the atrium, but it's going to go right down, and it's kind of like a shortcut. It's really close to the bundles of his, so it'll travel right down those bundles, causing a short PR interval. Your QRS is normal. It's 0.06 to 0.08, so we know it came from the atrium. So how do we interpret this rhythm? So we are in a sinus rhythm, and then we convert to a accelerated junctional. We call it accelerated because the heart rate of the junctional rhythm is greater than 60. A normal junctional rhythm would be 40 to 60. So since it's at 94, we call this accelerated junctional. And that probably wouldn't cause any hemodynamic issues with the patient because the heart rate is maintained, but it doesn't, you know, doesn't need, mean that you shouldn't be assessing and making sure that this is not continuing. In 8.9, this rhythm is regular. The heart rate is 47. You cannot see P waves, so therefore you cannot do a PR interval. If you looked really close, you might want to consider there's P waves behind the QRS, looking very closely. Your QRS is 0 0.08, so we know it came from the atrium. So this interpretation for this patient's rhythm is junctional. It came from the junction. So the it is regular. You can't see a P wave, or the P wave would be inverted. This one looks like it's in the back of the QRS, which can happen, but because the heart rate is between 40 and 60, we will call this a junctional rhythm. Now also note that if you notice there is ST depression, if you would go across your isoelectric line, you do have ST depression. So that may warrant a 12-bd kg and assess the patient's vital signs. All right, let's go to the next. So this rhythm, 8.16, is a regular rhythm, except it is irregular with some premature beats. So the underlying rate we can get is 58. It is sinus, except for the premature beat. Um, your PR interval is 0.16 to 0.18, and just again, reconfirming where you're measuring. And the PJC, which is right here, you're going to measure, that's a really short, it's about two boxes, that PR interval, so that's 0 0.08. Your QRS is normal, it's about two boxes, so you will, just going to make a mark as to where you're measuring your, looks like about two boxes, so your QRS is about 0 0.08. For your ter interpretation of this rhythm, it is a sinus Brady because your heart rate is 58 and it's below 60 and it has one PJC. And let me just remove all this stuff. So you have a PJC, again a premature beat, it came early and it would be either a PAC or a PJC because the QRS is normal. If it was a wide QRS, it'd be a PVC. But this P wave is inverted, so therefore we know it came from the junction, so we will call it a PJC. In 8.27, this rhythm is considered regular, so therefore we can get a heart rate of 65. The P waves, they are inverted, so if you're looking at these, these are actually inverted. Now, because they're inverted, we still can do a PR interval, but it's going to be really short. So I'm going to show you how we're measuring this PR. So right there to about right there, okay? So it's about two boxes, kind of right before it goes down or right before, right before the QRS. So this is your PR interval. It's about 0 0.08. 
your QRS, it's normal, it's coming from the atrium, so we know that it's 0.06 to 0 0.08, so if it's normal, it's coming from the atrium. So just re-emphasizing that a normal QRS means it's an atrial rhythm. Your junction is in the atrium, it's the bottom of the atrium, so we are going to name this an accelerated junctional because the heart rate is above 60 and 65 so we call this an accelerated junctional now the one thing that you must note on this rhythm that's significant is that you have some ST elevations and that could be indicative that the patient is having a STEMI so you would definitely want to check your patient get a 12 ED kg as soon as possible and follow your um, Q coronary syndrome guidelines. In 8.36, this rhythm is considered regular. The heart rate is 41. There is P's, but they're after the QRS. If you kind of see a little divvy in the back of those QRSs. So we cannot do a PR interval. Now I saw that your book said, gives you a PR interval of 0 0.04, but in order for you to have a PR interval, you have to have a P before the R, so that's not really significant. So I would say it's not applicable to do a PR interval on this rhythm strip. So we do have a QRS that is normal, 0.06 to 0 0.08, so we know it came from the atrium. So your interpretation of this, that it is a junctional rhythm because the heart rate is below between 40 and 60, so it is actually junctional. And how would you monitor this patient? You would first assess your patient. Are they stable or unstable? And if they're finding having signs and symptoms of hemodynamic instability, then they would probably follow your Brady algorithm. So again, you would assess your patient and note if there's vital signs are unstable, if they're having shortness of breath, chest pain, what their skin looks like, and follow that Brady algorithm. And on this last strip, so this rhythm is primarily regular. What makes it look irregular are the premature beats, the PJCs. So you can have a rate, and that's 58. So there's P waves that are sinus before, and then you have inverted P waves for your premature beats. So you can do a PR interval. So your PR interval for the sinus rhythm is about 0.16, but for the junctional or PJC, it's much shorter. It's about two, two and a half boxes. I'm just showing you right before to right before. So this is your PR interval for your junctional. So your QRSs are normal, so we know it all came from the atrium, and I really emphasize that because when you are assessing a, or interpreting a rhythm, the first thing you should note is the QRSs. Are they normal or are they wide? So if they're normal, you know it's an atrial rhythm, and then you know go through and see where in the atrium it came from. So with this rhythm, we know it originated primarily in the sinus, but you did have a couple of premature beats. Now those premature beats, you would rule out whether it's a PAC or a PJC because the QRS is normal, and both of those are in the atrium. So the P waves are inverted, so you would definitely note that it is a PJC, and it is quite often that your PJCs have shorter PR intervals than your PACs or your normal sinus beats. So there really isn't too much. So the interpretation of this is sinus Brady with PJCs. So again, if this is new for that patient, you would want to do 12 EKG, assess your patient. Also note that there are a couple U waves in here. You can notice the U waves. It's very low voltage. And I would assess that patient's um, potassium, magnesium, so I would assess the patient's electrolytes as well. When there's a U wave, it could be congenital, could be, you know, idiopathic, but for the most part, I would assess their electrolytes. And that concludes the atrial and junctional review of the homework.